think we all need a pep talk. The world needs you to stop being boring. Yeah, you. Boring is easy. Everybody can be boring, but you're gooder than that. Life is not a game, people. Life isn't a cereal either. Well, it is a cereal. And if life is a game, aren't we all on the same team? I mean, really, right? I'm on your team. Be on my team. This is life, people. You got air coming through your nose. You got heartbeat. That means it's time to do something. A poem. Two roads diverged in the woods, and I took the road less traveled. And it hurt, man! Really bad. Rocks, thorns, and glass. My pants broke. Wah! Not cool, Robert Frost. But well, they were in work too bad. I won't be in the one that leads to awesome. It's like that dude Journey said. Don't stop believing. Unless your dream's stupid. Then you should get a better dream. I think that's how it goes. I love that video. Good morning. Well, my name is Samuel Mead, and I am Pastor Andy and Sharon's son, so I'm here to give you like a mini Mead pep talk, <laughs> kind of like the little one did before me. Um, I don't know about you, but I am super excited, and let me tell you why. Because football season is right around the corner. There we go. We got some football fans in the house. Now, I'm a Pittsburgh Sp Steelers fan, so sorry. You just got to get with it. Well, I love the Steelers, but I, I try to watch as many games as I can, even beyond the Steelers. I love football. I play fantasy football. I've got my fiance to play fantasy football with me. I'm all about it. I love football. Now, my love of football, though, let me take you back with me, started back in middle school. And that's when I first uh, started playing football for my school's team. And our first year was, I was in seventh grade. And sadly, we were not that good. We went 0-7 our first year. We won zero games. But I had fun, and that's what the coach told me mattered. So, but don't worry, it gets better. Varsity, I played four years of varsity uh, football in high school, though, and we were a lot better. Our team ended every season with a winning record. We went to state semifinals two years in a row and then even won the state championships one year. You can see they're going to uh, throw up a video, uh, photo there. If that's the team after the Friday night game we played. Um, if you're looking for me, I'm on the far right, 25. It was, it was a lot of fun. That was a while back. We won state championships. Great memory. Um, I, I was blessed enough to go on to play football at the collegiate level at Christopher Newport University right up the road. And as much as I enjoyed playing uh, football in college, there was something, though, about that high school team that was different, something that that team had that no other athletic team that I've ever played on has had before. And looking back from a tenured players and fan position, I came to the conclusion that that varsity team's power of belonging was the key that made it successful. It was the power of belonging that made that team successful. We were not successful because we had one or two all-stars, and we weren't successful because we had a Hall of Fame coaching staff. And don't get me wrong, though, we did have some great players, and that helps, but that wasn't the secret to our success. No, the underlying principle to our success, to that team, was that every single person on that team knew that they were part of that team. They knew they played a role. They knew they were needed, and they knew they belonged. Look at this verse with me, Romans 12, 15. So in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs, I want you to underline that word, belongs to all the others. The truth is, Vineyard Community Church, is, or any other church for that matter, is just like a team. Shoot, we even have our games on Sunday, like our Sunday services. This is our 9 a.m. game right here. You know, it's just, just like a football game. And, but we, what makes us different is we are a team of individuals who are attempting with the help of the Holy Spirit to become more fully devoted followers of Christ. And now a lot of people are like, yeah, that sounds right. That's what I'm trying to do. But, but people forget the first part of that sentence. We are a team. They forget that part. They're like, yeah, I'm trying to be more like Christ. You know, what would Jesus do? I'm trying to become more like him every day. But they forget that it's not just you. It's a team effort. We're all trying to do that together. You are not meant to do it alone. Some people just show up for the Sunday service game, and then you don't see them until next Sunday. Well, I'll see you next Sunday. You know, that's, that, that wouldn't work. In any other sport with a team, that would not work. 
We got the Olympic Games coming up in Rio. Imagine if Michael Phelps and his relay team only got together once a week for the games. How well do you think they'd do? Probably not that good. Although Michael Phelps, I think his mother is a mermaid or something because he is crazy. So he might pull something out. But in all seriousness, they probably would not do that well. And I want us here at Vineyard to be a gold, real Olympic team. I want us to be a state championship team. I want us to be an all-stars team. So how do we do that? How do we become an effective Vineyard Church team? How do we harness the power of belonging? Well, as I sat down and kind of drew this up and tried to figure it out, I came up with three key ingredients that I think helped create successful teams, and I want to apply them to here to us at Vineyard. The first ingredient to having an effective church team is vision. Vision. Now, why vision? Because there is power in vision. Power in the vision. Vision ignites emotions and evokes feelings that normally wouldn't come about by your own means. They wouldn't come about by you. Bill Hybels once said that a vision is a picture of the future that creates passion. What a great statement. It shows you the power of vision. It's able to create something inside of you. It's able to create passion. Look at this verse with me, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Now, this verse is an excerpt from a letter that the prophet Jeremiah wrote to the Israelites who had been taken into captivity, into exile, by the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. And if the Israelites ever needed vision, it was now. They were at a place where they felt their God had abandoned them, that they were no longer his chosen people, that all hope for a better future had all but been lost. They needed vision right now. And we can see in the scripture that God used Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, as a vessel to cast vision. And Jeremiah, probably, he probably didn't even know what he was really doing. He didn't even know the power he was wielding. But God knew. God knew the power of the vision that he was using Jeremiah for. He used Jeremiah to cast hope for a better future. Jeremiah was able to use the power of vision to give the Israelites something to not only look forward to, but something to belong to. And that's the key. The second ingredient needed in order to produce a successful church team is off-the-field development. Off-the-field development. Now, what do I mean by off-the-field development? Well, I mean individuals in a church who are one by one committing themselves to off-site spiritual developmental practices. Well, that's a lot. Well, in other words, your spiritual growth doesn't just happen on Sundays. It doesn't just happen right here. You take it off-site. You take it home with you. You work on your craft day in and day out. Notice this verse with me, 1 Timothy 4, 7. Take the time and trouble to keep yourself spiritually fit. Practices like fervent prayer, solitude, reflection, private worship, sharing your heart with other believers, the study of scriptures, acts of serving in the name of Christ, the careful following of the Spirit's prompting, bold proclamations of the love of Christ to family and friends. These are all exercises to keep you spiritually fit, to keep you spiritually in shape. These are things you can take off-site that are meant to be taken off-site so you can spiritually grow. And this is the cool part. When our individual off-the-field rigors are engaged enthusiastically, the whole church gets stronger, not just you. When you take it off-site and you work on it, it's not just you who grows. We all grow. It benefits everybody. And here's the truth, though. You yourself determine the strength, the maturity, the potential, and the future of this church by your off-site spiritual engagements and by your off-site practices by your level of personal belonging. The final crucial, crucial ingredient in producing a championship-level church team is small group practices. Now I want to spend a little bit of time on this one because this one a lot of times is forgotten. People, oh, I'm, I buy into the vision. They're a part of the vision. Then they buy into, okay, I got to work on me. I get that. But then they forget we got to work on the team. They forget that, that they have to take themselves with a couple other people and work on their craft. One of the biggest differences between the 0 and 7 team I played for in middle school and the varsity state championship level team I played for was the way we did practice. Now, the middle school team I played for, it would have made you dizzy just watching us <laughs> practice. We went out there in 100 degree heat. Our coaches 
bless their hearts. They loved us, but they did not know what they were doing. They had all the kids running around, uh, trying to put them in the place they thought best belonged. You go run with the ball this way. You run with the ball this way. And then when it came game time, we just fell apart. You know, half the kids didn't even want to be there. Half the kids were at the beach in their heads. You know, it was, it was bad. On the other hand, though, our varsity football team, we had something. We, what we would do for our practice is we would come together and then we'd break up into small groups based on your position. So, for example, me, I played running back and linebacker in high school. And so I would spend half an hour of our practice time just with the running backs and a half an hour just with the linebackers before we came into team practice. And that, that practice time with that small group was key. And it was key because we were in a smaller group. We were able to get through more exercises that were more attuned to who, you know, what we needed, our position. We developed stronger relationships with each other. So like the team was my family. You know, we all rah-rah, the team is my family. But those guys I spent that half an hour with, they were my brothers. You know, I spent way more time with them, got way closer. I knew them. I knew about their family situations. And we just played football together. And I knew I could go to them if I had something outside of football. That's how close we were. And I, that would never have happened in a big team situation. Another thing that benefited us from our little small group practices was that we knew the role we played on the overall team. We knew the position we played and where we belonged. We knew where we fell. We knew that we were needed because when it came together, when we came together for team practice, if a group didn't get their stuff done, you could tell. And the whole team suffered. Every position mattered and everybody was needed. We also knew that we were pursuing a dream together. At that time, it was the dream of just winning game and having the goal each week to win a game. But we had a bigger dream. We had the dream of winning state championships. And it took a couple years, but we had that dream. But we knew that we, and we figured out we couldn't do it alone. We needed each other to get there. The principle is the same for our church here, our church team. We need each other to accomplish our dream. What is our dream? Well, as Jacob kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, our dream is our mission statement. And our mission statement is to be a contemporary extension of the good news of Jesus Christ to our community and to help people find and fulfill God's calling on their lives. That's our mission. And the truth is, though, that's, that's a state championship level mission. That's a state championship, a gold medal dream. And I can't do it alone. Nobody can do it alone. That's why we need each other. We need to be a team to take on this mission. We need to participate in our small group practices as a church if we want to become that championship church to take on that dream. Ephesians 4, 9 and 10. Two are better than one because together they can work more effectively. If one of them falls down, the other can help him up. Now we have a wide variety of groups here at church. We have connect groups, affinity groups, training groups, you know, victory groups. We got every kind of group. And we do that though, we do that for you. We want you to grow. It's not as much for us as it is for you. It's for you to belong to the team. It's for you to have a way in, a position to play. And the team needs you. That's what it really is. And here's the truth, though. If, you don't, if you've ever thought about it, there are some things, some certain areas of spiritual growth that you just can't do on your own. If you read the scripture, you'll know this. But on the other end, people don't realize this. You also can't do it in a large group setting like this either. You just can't. You will only be able to do some types of spiritual growth if you are a part of a small group practice. So on the back of your outline, there are five areas of your spiritual growth that are best developed in a small group. The first one is confession. Confession can happen in a small group. And confession is powerful. Very powerful. Now, confession, what is confession? Well, confession is sharing your heart and your pain with someone else. First, the Bible says in James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Well, that's a command that's pretty tough to carry out by yourself. That's a command that's really tough to carry out in solitude because the definition of solitude is being by yourself. And now there are some spiritual practices that I listed earlier that you need to work on by yourself. But th this is one of them that you can't do. You need somebody else to do it. You can't confess your sin to another person if they're not there. And you can't do it with several hundred people either. That's kind of, you know, impractical, impractical as well. 
Yet the practice of confession is critical to the life of a Christ follower. Listen to the words of a man here who fumbled a few moral balls and is living with the guilt and the shame of having done so. He writes, because of my sin, my guilt is overwhelming to me. It is a burden to heave for me, to bear. Because of my sinful folly, I am crushed in spirit. And here's the phrase I want you to remember. And sadness follows me wherever I go. Sadness follows me wherever I go. Now that's from Psalm 38. And that was written by King David. He wrote, sadness follows me wherever I go after he had sinned. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I find myself, you know, falling into sin, it's, it's something else. It's like grief grips me in a new way. Even though I pray and I know that's kind of, you know, I love Jesus and I pray and I know my sins are washed white as snow. But it's, I guess it's part of human nature. I forget that I've been forgiven. And it just grips me, you know, and it's probably partially the attack, you know, of reminding me, oh, you're not, you're not meant to be what you are. Jesus doesn't have a plan for you, you know, and that constant, you know, that's why we need, we're not meant to take on that alone. We're meant to be reminded that Jesus forgave you and that he's there to, he's, he's forgotten already. Your sins are as far as the east is from the west. But part of us being human is we forget that. So that's why confession is critical. That's why it commands us to do that. You wonder why does it command us to confess our sin to somebody else? That's kind of weird. Well, it's because it helps you realize the forgiveness you've been given. I tell people who come up to me constantly saying, I, you know, it just doesn't make sense. Why would God forgive me? He doesn't know me, the things I've done, the things I've been in, the people I've been around, you know, just horrible things. I can't accept his gift of grace. And he doesn't want me either. Well, I usually respond to them by saying, You'll never know the full acceptance of God and his full and powerful love if you never experience it from one of his children. And that's us. You play a powerful role in someone's life when you confess to them and you allow them to confess to you. Another example of a spiritual practice that occurs optimally in a small group as opposed to in solitude or in a large gathering like this is the life application of God's word. Any gains or progress I've ever made on spiritual growth or in personal character growth have come when someone's come up to me and challenged me. And they've said, you know, your life doesn't really match what the book you read. It doesn't match the scripture that you teach. And I'm like, man, you're right. And then I have to realign myself with scripture. But I, I don't do that myself. Somebody has to come up to me and hold me accountable and show me how to apply scripture to my life. Once again, that doesn't happen in solitude. That doesn't happen in large group gatherings either. It happens when you're in a small group. My fiance, Olivia, and I are currently a part of a family life victory group here at Vineyard. And this group has challenged us to include more of Christ in his will, not only in our respective lives, but in our relationship and future marriage. And I hope that this group is making me not only a better man, but a better husband in the future. And it's doing that by appropriately showing me how to apply scripture to my life and how to live like the man God wants me to be and how to be the husband God wants me to be. Number three, so we have confession, life application of God's word. And the third practice that happens best in a small group is accountability. Proverbs twenty-seven seventeen: people learn from one another just as iron sharpens iron. In Hebrews 3.13, every day keep encouraging one another so that none of you is hardened by the glamour of sin. Sooner or later, most Christ followers, if they're progressing in their spiritual growth, come to a place where they just say, I can't take it anymore. The Lord has been the leader of my life, but really he hasn't been the leader of every area of my life. If you're progressing in your Christian faith, you always come to this point. You probably come to it multiple times because the Lord keeps revealing to you that he's not the real leader in certain areas of your life. I know this is true with me. There's always areas that I keep uncovering that, you know, I'm really actually holding in my back pocket that I'm not ready to let go. One of these areas was my fiance. And once again, my fiance, Olivia, and I were a part of another group, a training group that this summer that went through the financial peace, Dave Ramsey's financial peace class. And in this group, we learned how to handle money in a God-glorifying way. I didn't even know it, but I was kind of, you know, 
I was tithing, you know, I was, you know, giving my offering, but I was still holding on to money pretty tight because, you know, I, I had to pay the bills. I have to, you know, I'm living on my own soon, mom. I can't be doing this, you know, and it, it was just an area where I was not ready to kind of let go. And this group, though, it helped me grow in this area. It showed me how to use money in God-glorifying ways. It showed me how to live within my means, how to get out of debt, how to have savings, how to care for the poor, and how to tithe. One of the assignments in this group we had was we had to bring in a weekly budget. So Olivia and I would be drawing up our budget for a month, and we'd come in every week with it, kind of updating it as we went. And I tell you, it was, man, it was hard. It really was. It took discipline. And I tell you, I did not enjoy the process, but I am thankful for the result. Isn't that so true with discipline, though? Think back to when you were a kid. You hated getting disciplined, but you're thankful for the result now. Dave Ramsey actually said in his class that personal finance is 80% behavior and 20% in head knowledge. And I don't know about you, but behavior for me is hard to change. It's hard, and I can't do it alone. That's why I'm so thankful Olivia and I had accountability in this class to bring in the budget every week and be able to show that we did it and that we were growing together. I can tell you honestly today, standing up here, that I would still be in the same poor money management skills if I hadn't been held accountable in that class, if I had just been required to show up and watch the videos and learn, I wouldn't have, you know, I would have come away with some cool nuggets, but I would not have grown. See, it just comes down to the issue that sooner or later, you just get tired of failing God. You just get tired of trying to white knuckle it and trying to do it yourself. When you really want change to come in in a radical way, that's when you invite accountability with people who know you well and also love you. That's key. They love you. Jesus said that some sins won't die unless we deal with them ruthlessly. Well, I'm telling you that accountability is dealing with something ruthlessly because you're opening yourself up. You're inviting someone else in. Let me bring up another one. How about discerning God's guidance? Is something that is optimal in a small group setting. Now, this one can seem pretty complex and pretty daunting. Isn't it hard to sometimes figure out how God is leading your future? I know it is for me. In my current season of life, I have people all around me who are making major life decisions. They're getting ready to go to college, trying to decide where they want to go, what they want to study, whether they want to get married, choosing their spouse, whether they want to have kids. You know, there are all these life decisions, major career choices. And I tell them, you know, these aren't going away. You know, if I asked everybody in here to raise their hands, if they were at a crossroads and they're like, a flurry of hands would go up. Because we're always at crossroads in life. We're always trying to deal with the next thing. We're always working on something. And they would come up to me, these people, and they would ask me for my counsel, what do you think I should do? Should I, you know, give me your input on this major life decision. And I would feel bad, but I would politely decline to give them input because I feel I, I would be doing them a disservice if I gave them my input. And that's because I don't know them that well. I really don't. I don't know them beyond their names. I don't know their leadership styles, their weaknesses, their aptitudes, their gifted mix, their backgrounds, their stories, and so on. I just don't know them. And it could be dangerous to give them advice without knowing them. You see, effective counsel requires intimate knowledge of a person. It really does. You have to know somebody to be able to counsel them. But those individuals shouldn't have to go it alone. God never made us, as I've said before, to walk the Christian life alone. We are meant to do it together. Proverbs 10, 22. Plans fail without good advice, but they succeed with the advice of many others. I'll tell you right now, I'm, I'm actually getting married in a month. And I cannot imagine telling you, and I'm the guy, so I cannot imagine how Olivia feels. And I cannot imagine how anxious I would be if I didn't have counsel around me. If I didn't have, you know, people who have gone through it and done it and, you know, wise and loving who care about me and care about, you know, they want to see me happy and they, you know, Olivia happy and they want to make sure we're making the right choices. And man, if that, if I had had all of that piled on top of me for me to decide by myself with the marriage, I couldn't imagine doing it. I don't know how people do it outside without their church family. It's crazy. One final practice that's optimally experienced in a tight-knit small group, and that is the expression of love. 
Now, there are some, I know, tough guys in here who would say, oh, expression of love, what's that? I don't need that. That's not for me. But really, those people need it the most. It's always the tough football guys that need the expression of love. And they're always the ones afraid of the shots, too. I can tell you, that's me. I hate shots at the doctor. That's when I need my expression of love the most. Expression of love, expression of loyalty, expressions of affirmation, encouragement, support, they touch you. They touch me, I know that. And when I think about why they touch me, why they soften my heart so much when I hear them, it's because I dwell on them. It's because I never really get them. When I step back and look at it, we never get expressions of love in the workplace, at school, in the neighborhood. The only time you really get expressions of love is from your immediate family, and that's only on your birthday. <laughs> it's horrible, but it's so true. Don't tell Dad I said that. No, I'm joking. But it's so true, though. We, I mean, we're so busy. We're moving through life so fast. We've got to do the next thing, next thing, and we forget You know, people just forget, you know, to share those expressions of love. And that's where the small group comes in because that's a place where we express love. We express affirmation. We express loyalty. That's a place where you can get that pouring into. And we all need that. We really do. I just was talking to a couple the other day that is a part of a connect group. And, you know, they just do life together. They meet once a week. And, you know, they were actually going through, though, their leader had a close family member pass away recently. And it was very tough. And that connect group rallied around her. And without even, you know, really asking, they, they took turns doing different things for her. They would show up, cut her lawn. They would go get groceries for her and do other little around the house, you know, that seemed like mundane things. But really, you know, I got up with the leader after the fact, a couple weeks after it happened. And she told me they weren't little things. They were actually big expressions of love. I love hearing stories like that. And she just shared how much it touched her, how much those little expressions meant such a big deal in such a hard time. And we all need that. We all need expressions of love. We all need to belong. Whether we know it or not, we need to. The varsity football state championship team that had the ingredients for a successful team that I played on were vision, off-the-field development, and small unit practice. Another football team, the 1972 Dolphins, coached by Don Shula. If you know anything about football, you know this team. And that's because they are the only team in NFL history to go through a season undefeated. No other team in history has done that in the NFL. They are the only team to ever complete a perfect record season and win the title. When Don Shula was asked how he put together this historic team, how did he do it? What's the key? He said, I don't want a player that's content with not playing. But we wanted to play the guys that got us here. Don Shula had a team of players that knew they belonged. He had a team of players that wanted to be there. He had a team that wanted more, that desired for more. And I want more for us. I want more for our vineyard team. I want more for you. I have a dream of having a state championship level vineyard church team. A gold medal Rio Olympics church team. And that's not impossible. I look out and I see the talent the spiritual talent, the physical gifts God has given you, everything. I see the talent right in front of me. I know we have the makings of a gold Olympic team, a state championship team. But that, the key word is team. I can't do it alone. No one can do it alone. I need you to be on board. It's time to get off the bench and get in the game. We need you. There's a position empty right now. We need you. It's time to be a part of the team because we need you and because you belong. Let's bow our heads. Come, Father. We invite your presence.
Thank you so much for your gift of love. Yeah. I know there's some in here today who heard this message. And the whole time they were saying, how in the world can I be a part of this team if I'm not even sure about Jesus? Isn't that the first step? Well, no. We here at Vineyard believe in community. We believe in our team. We believe in community before conversion. And that's because we just simply want to know you. We want to be your friend. So you are invited to play. Yes. But I do want to give you the opportunity today to make the Lord the captain of your team. To make him the leader of your life. I'm telling you right now that Jesus says you belong. It's not just me. It's Jesus who's saying you belong. You belong to him and our family. And he wants you to join up. He wants you back. He needs you to play your position. If you're ready to join his team, or if you're done sitting on the sideline and you're ready to get in the game, would you follow me in this prayer? Lord, I am done playing for myself. I want to become a part. A part of a committed team for God. For you. I recognize that I'm not perfect. That I'm a sinner. But it's okay. Because you are the captain of my team. You are the Lord of my life. Your sacrifice on Calvary Hill, on the cross, made it possible for me to be a part of this team. So I accept your gift of salvation, your gift of love, and I believe in you. Thank you. I am a child of the Most High God. And I belong to Him. Yeah. In Jesus' name, amen.